Jeff, thank you so much for coming on the Easy Prey podcast today. My pleasure. I uh, I am glad to be here, and this is a conversation that I'm excited to have. So, uh, me too. Let's uh, get a little of the background out of the way. Can you tell the audience who you are and what you do? Sure. So, uh, my name is Jeff Lerner. I am, I'd say I spend most of my my day as the CEO of an online uh, entrepreneurial education platform called Entra Institute. Um, and uh, we've been in business about four years. Prior to that, I have been an entrepreneur literally since I was 16 years old. I actually dropped out of high school. Um, I was actually, I was also a working jazz musician all through my 20s. So I was kind of a part-time musician, well, really full-time musician, part-time entrepreneur all through my 20s. Started lots of different businesses, never had much money, never had much success. I actually failed at almost a dozen of them in my 20s, different entrepreneurial ventures. Um, and then in the late 2000s, about 2008, 2009, I got involved uh, in online marketing and had a considerable amount of success, which was really good because I was also half a million dollars in debt from those more traditional business failures. And so I actually had enough success that I was able to pay off that debt, never never declared bankruptcy, actually you know, swam my way back to the surface, so to speak. And then I've basically been doing, ever since 2009, I've been doing a number of different either online or hybrid physical digital businesses, really leveraging what I call the modern economy and the modern opportunity of entrepreneurship. So I did affiliate marketing for several years. Um, I had a digital agency and, and provided marketing agency services for small and medium sized businesses all around the United States and Canada. Did that for about five years. Uh, I had an online a training company that was actually a direct sales company for two years. And that actually overlapped with the agency. But then in 2018, I, I shut down the direct sales training company and I sold the agency. I had a nice exit. Um, and I was basically 39 years old and retired. And nice I, place and, to be. Yeah. And, and bear in mind, that's, that's having, having been a high school dropout turned jazz musician, right? So in the traditional book of how to be successful, I did nothing that you're supposed to do, right? I dropped it out. I became a musician. I followed my my creative passions, failed at 11 different businesses. I mean, I didn't do anything right, except I was 39 and I was retired because of the power of legitimate modern entrepreneurship. You know, some of the stuff that you talk about, what's legit, what isn't. Well, when you do it legit, amazing things can happen for your life. So it was 2018. I sold my agency, shut down my other business. And I'm like, well, what do I do now? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not actually going to retire. I'll, you know, just go nuts. And I don't really like to golf. So um, I ended up starting to put out content on the internet, teaching people about the opportunities of the modern, modern economy. And also really what I'm passionate about. I'm actually deeply passionate about psychology, personal development, communication theory, and, and how to really level up all areas of your life through the way that we interact with the world. And so I started putting out content that sort of tried to fuse together the, the entrepreneurial, more business-focused aspect of what's possible in the world, but couple that with a real true grounding in personal development and kind of who do you need to become in order to go become a successful entrepreneur in the modern world. And that uh, that sort of novel fusion of subjects really struck a chord with people, and my content started getting shared a lot. Uh, and within a year, I realized I've really got something here in terms of a viable, potentially a viable business, actually training business of teaching people how to take advantage of the new economy. So in uh, summer of 2019, we actually created a course, and that course has now been purchased uh, by about 275,000 people. And they're, they're, we've created a bunch more courses. We have software, we have a coaching program, we have live personal development events. Essentially, Entre Institute's grown into one of the largest platforms in the world that teaches people how to go out into the modern world and create a business or learn monetizable skills that allow them to create the life they want now, rather than the old model, which says, well, spend 40 years trading your time for money in some traditional job, and then maybe you'll be able to retire someday and have the life you want once you're, you know, potentially too old to really enjoy it much, I think you can have it now if you understand how the economy works. And so that's yeah. what we teach. So, it's, I mean, it's it's interesting. I think the you and I are, are around the same age. The how you start a business and 
what work life looks like has changed a lot since we well when we we were you know entering the job market it was you you know for our parents it was you work 40 or 50 years at the same job and you retire for people of our generation it's maybe you work 10 or 15 years then you switch companies and you stay in the same industry you just do 10 years 20 years 10 years 20 years and you're done well and the average person now actually changes jobs more than every two years I, more, yeah it's tw- every, i think the average job tenure now is 22 months I, that, that, to me that to me that's crazy from you know when i started working it was you know you are an irresponsible messed up person if you can't stay somewhere 10 years yeah, I mean, we, you know, at, at Entra, we, we've hired, you know, we've scaled really fast. We've probably hired 120 people in the last, you know, two years or so. And so I've seen a lot of resumes. Um, and it doesn't really matter if you're talking about entry level positions, you're talking about senior executive positions, like every resume now has like 10 or 12 job history, you know, <laughs> items on it. Yeah, it's crazy. And the other thing was, I remember when I first started my first full time, you know, real job, it was... If we find out that you're doing anything on the side, right. even if it's an even if it's an unrelated industry, we're terminating your employment immediately. Yeah. And it's so funny now, like almost employers, like as part of the interview process, it's like, well, what are you doing on the side? Yeah, well, and I think you know some of that is is a shift in mindset, and I think some of that is also an economic reality. You know, if employers are going to try to keep their their employees from making extra money, then they need to pay them enough to live in the modern world. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, they, I think they'll, they'll take the cheaper option. Yeah. So, so there's, this there's been this massive rise in the gig economy, you know, people deciding, Hey, I don't want to work 40 hours a week for one person. I want to kind of set my own schedule, do my own thing. And then this little thing called COVID happened and everybody had to start working from home in one one respect or another. And this was a massive rise in just not just people working for the gig economy, but the opportunities there, I, I think have exploded. You have lots of people that are starting businesses that like, hey, I can't afford someone full time. And this whole gig thing is awesome because now I can bring someone on five or 10 hours a week or for a project and I don't have to worry about, you know, all, all mm-hmm. the the legal aspects of hiring and firing and benefits and I could just do this quick and easy. But it also leads to a rise in, 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 in fake job opportunities and just outright scams. So let's talk a little bit about that and how to discern between the two. Yeah. So I think that it's interesting, like, like everything's gotten kind of muddy and fuzzy, right? And, <laughs> and, and the world is just not as black and white as it used to be, right? Like it used to be you either owned a business or you worked for somebody that owned a business. Yeah. Right. In a business you didn't know. Now, get down is there's four ways that you can go out so I'm pausing right there. Did my did did my mic did my audio just change? Yes, you cut out for just a moment. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So I'll I'll pick up where I said uh, yep. where I was. So now there's basically four ways, and you even you even heard it in what I said earlier about Entra, where we we teach you either how to start a business or monetize a skill. I use that term intentionally because the only way to do it now, like you can be entrepreneurial. In fact, I think in the modern world, you have to be entrepreneurial. Yeah. I think survive, you know, the new Darwinism is survival of the most entrepreneurial. But that doesn't mean, you know, getting a tax ID, opening a bank account, hanging a shingle, and opening a traditional business per se, right? There's yeah. really four ways that you can go, you know, get money in the entrepreneurial economy. You can have a job, which by the way, some jobs can feel extremely entrepreneurial. I mean, I, I employ over 200 people and not one of them reports to an office. We don't even have an office. I'm talking <laughs> to you from my house right now, right? Like, um, and, and we're very flexible in our schedules and and there's a lot of, you know, very entrepreneurial. I would say, you know, entre- you know, at, at our company, it's probably even better than owning a business. You get a lot of the perks without a lot of the headaches, right? So you can be an employee in an entrepreneurial culture, you can also be, like you said, a freelancer or part of what we would call the gig economy, which comes with more uncertainty, but also probably maximum flexibility. Uh, you can be a pure, call it a, a purebred entrepreneur, somebody that truly is going to own the business, put their neck on the line, raise the capital, employ the people, make, make the payroll, so forth. And 
there's actually ways now that you can be an investor if you have the right know-how, whether it's trading penny stocks, whether it's uh, owning vacation rental properties, sometimes which you don't even have to put up the money to acquire in the first place. Um, I, I mean, I know a guy that literally leases cars and then subleases them to drivers who themselves do not have automobiles that meet Uber's criteria. And he essentially arbitrages Uber drivers <laughs> by subleasing a car. Like there's, that's just, that's really just investment. And I guess technically quasi business ownership too. Like everything's gotten fuzzy, right? So I think that's really important for people to understand or to kind of broaden their thinking is like, I, I, in fact, we're even literally going through a rebrand right now at Entra where we're actually try our rebrand is around this whole like wilderness adventure theme because when i think of the modern economy i think of like Yellowstone park or like like a, a jungle or more i like mountains because they're you can climb them and, and achieve great views right but like there's a million paths there's a million great views there's a million ways to die by the way you can fall in a crevice or you can get hit by a tree branch or attacked by a bear like there's a million you know the dangers the paths the views like it, we live in this crazy will wild wild economic west now and i think you know the key is to have a guide as much as possible have a map and get properly equipped with the right skills and the right know-how and you can go out and and it's not a bad thing that you may change jobs every year or two. The reality, you know, there's a million ways to make a buck now. Yeah. But you got to have the right skills. And sadly, I don't think school is is really prepared. Like school is not preparing people to venture forth. That's, you know, and that's my, the gap in the market that I'm trying to fill. But anyway, I know that you, you brought it up from the standpoint of scams. And what I will say as, you know, I see thousands of students coming in trying to do it the right way. And sadly, a lot of them have burn marks on their back. Yeah. Because they've gotten scorched and there is a lot of craziness out there. And I think that people do need to kind of up their guard these days. And basically, if you can't, if you can't vet it, and there's, you know, we can talk about what that means to actually vet it, but if you can't vet it, you shouldn't trust it. Yeah. Well, let, let, let's talk about how you go about vetting an opportunity, whether it's a, as a gig worker, let's from each of those aspects, let's talk about how we can vet opportunities. Yeah. So I think that, I mean, the number one thing is, is va val verifiable social proof, meaning, it, it, and I think that anybody that's on, I'll call it on this side of it, where it's like, you are the purveyor of an opportunity, whether mm -hmm. it's, you're selling an education program that teaches people how to do it, or you're promoting an oppor an actual opportunity itself, or even if you're promoting a, a gig listing on a on a platform like like um, you know Upwork or or Freelancer.com or whatever, you know you have an obligation to meet the consumer at their very understandable place of mistrust. Yeah. So it, it used to be like caveat emptor. You know, I told you that's a good deal. Take my word for it. It's a good deal. Like you can't expect a consumer to take your word for it anymore. And I believe it's actually unreasonable to. Yeah. Like you as the purveyor of the opportunity, I think you have an obligation to make it impossible for them to doubt your credibility. Like the onus is on the, on the, the, the purveyor now. Right. Yeah. And I do think that's a shift. And so you've got to be able, I mean, I think that if you're produ if you're putting opportunities out to the market, one of the things you need to be doing, let's say you're you're promoting a gig. I think that as part of your gig hiring process, you need to say, hey, when you come work for us, part of the gig is that you will shoot a testimonial that verifying that we were a legit gig and we did take good care of you and we did pay you on time and we did meet all of our obligations and that you'll allow and that you'll allow us to use that in our marketing and even be willing to back us up if somebody cross checks it by finding you and asking you if, you, if it was legit. Because who knows, maybe it was a deep fake that we planted yeah. in a video <laughs> of you or something, right? And I think it's it's kind of come to that. But by the way, when you do that, how legit does that present you as to the person looking at the gig to say, hey, when you take this gig, we're going to ask you for an endorsement of how legit this was. Well, that, make, that makes them feel like it's more legit, especially if you've also done it and they have someone else they can cross-reference. So yeah. I think a lot of the responsibility is on the... The, the provider of the opportunity. And frankly, if they haven't taken that responsibility, I think you as a participant in the gig economy should just say no. 
Yeah. I mean, it, it's definitely one of the things, you know, anytime I have a vendor, I always vet them. I've, I've made the mistake and not done a good job vetting before and, it, and it's bit me in the butt. Um, but definitely like the vetting is like whenever I look at a, a, a company, I'm like, well, is their phone number on their website? How new is their website? Mm-hmm. Do, do the social media links in the footer go anywhere? Are those social media accounts active? And that's just kind of the, that's just the thing. Are they even in, in existing business, let alone can they actually do what they say they're going to do? Yeah, I think there's there's that aspect of it for sure, right? Which is, they call it like the the technicalities, right? Yeah. V- validating the technicalities um, and, and looking them up. Like you can look up any LLC, any business incorporated entity, you can look up on a state, on a secretary of state website or, you know, figure out where they're incorporated. Like you can check and make sure that that stuff checks out. But I think there's another level of sophistication and, and call it common sense that you have to develop. And this is where entrepreneurialism and being an entrepreneurial thinker, even if you're not an entrepreneur per se, is so important. Even if you don't own a business, understanding what goes into owning a business and some of the mechanics of it are are part of how you keep from getting scammed or screwed by people pretending to own a business. And so I'll give you an example. If you go some program, Sorry, I think my mic might have done that thing again. I need to stop touching it. Um, if you go sign up for some program, and this program says, you know, people that go through this program uh, make X amount of dollars, you know, in, in the first 90 days or in the first 12 months or whatever, right? So that that you might view that as really compelling. You go, oh, that's exciting that they they are telling me how much their students are going to make, right? They, heck, they might even be guaranteeing me that. But let me ask you something. If somebody takes a course from you, I'll use myself. We we actually teach when we have courses, right? Somebody takes a course from us. Uh, let's say they go through one of our like our digital agency path, right? We have a path that'll teach people how to set up a digital agency, um, and they get it set up in ninety days, and then we have you know training on how to grow it and scale it and get clients and provide services and all that, right? Somebody goes through that for a year. How the heck do I know how much money they made, right? Now, if I know how much money they made, that actually is a sign that they're either either I I forced them to use my merchant accounts, or I actually set them up as my as an affiliate for my products, and they're processing it through an engine that I can view the the, the stats on, or that it's really a business opportunity or an MLM where they're actually just recruiting other people into my ecosystem. And because you, it's like, how would they even have the data to know how much money their students are yeah. making? Even Harvard can't tell you how much their students make. Yeah. So it's like, if you understand the mechanics of business, you'll see through the smoke screen. But if you don't, you'll get enticed by the smoke screen. Well, I think it's also the the understanding of, you know, is someone going to pay me well beyond what my skill set is? You know, if, I, if yeah. I'm looking for an entry level job and let's say I'm a, I'm a high school dropout, you know, I can... Maybe I can answer the phone. I could do some, you know, light customer support stuff. And someone comes along and says, "Hey, you do this, and I'll pay you a quarter million dollars a year with your skill set." There's, a, there's, there's, that should be a red flag. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, and I think that, you know, gosh, I, not to veer into other, other territory, but like I was on social media today, and I made a comment. You know, live and learn. I never should have, but I made a comment on a post about quiet quitting right? This controversial topic that, you know, it's very sort of populist wave of, of resentment. And I get it. I get where it's coming from. But, the, you know, this uh, there's sort of this default attitude out, out there, I think, sometimes where, like, people want more for less because they feel like they've gotten less for more. Yeah. Meaning, you know, I worked hard. I put in the hours. I've done all the things I was supposed to do. And I feel like I've been screwed by my employer. I feel like everybody's out there trying to screw me. So now, you know, if I can't, I can't beat them. So I'm going to join them and I'm just going to go try to screw them. Right. Which means I'm going to clock in, but do as little work as possible and still try to get paid. Or like you said, I'm going to go try to, you know, find some opportunity that's going to vastly overcompensate me relative to my level of education or experience. Right. Like, you still have to operate from sound first principles Yeah. of like, there should always be rough parity of value, you know, because if not, somebody's getting screwed yeah. and I don't think you want to be the screwer or the screwy. So why would you take that gig if your principles are sound, right? 
Yeah. And I think if we if we can ground ourselves in like the fact that capitalism isn't this horrible thing that is a game you're supposed to cheat your way to the top of. It may have gotten hijacked by some companies or some bad bosses or some unethical whatevers, but fundamentally it's produced the most prosperity and the greatest standard of living in the history of civilization. It literally civilization is defined by the prosperity that civil that that you know capitalism has produced. And the first principles of capitalism are around healthy exchange of value. And if you ground yourself to that, you'll keep yourself from from screwing or getting screwed. So I I, I mean I think at some level. People do have to take responsibility for their participation in these scams. There's, you know, I come from the world of marketing. So in internet marketing, we, 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 there's actually this sort of cynical comment that people make that people have been around for a while. We're like, oh, you got to watch out. You got to watch out for a certain type of customer because they're, they're going to turn, they're going to make your thing a scam. Like a certain type of customer will come into your world and bait you mm. to say things. Like they're like, they'll, they'll ask you these leading questions where they're just like begging you to tell them, you're going to make a million dollars in 90 days. Okay, dude, like stop. And they're like, well, are, is there any way I can make more than that? Or like, wait, if I were, if I stay up really, really late at night and I go through the training even faster, are you sure that I couldn't hit six figures in the first 30 days? Like they're just begging you to make a promise that's, and, and so, I mean, you know, thankfully, uh, th that's, you know, we, we don't, I, I'm not involved in anything that could even make those types of suggestions. But like, there are a lot of people out there. And I get it, it comes from a legitimate, probable place of desperate, you know, it's hard to know, is somebody desperate or lazy, like, you don't know. But like, we've got to get to like, sound principled living. That's how you avoid this stuff. Now, because otherwise, it gets reduced to the ridiculous, where it's like, oh, I got to make 19 phone calls to validate a job offer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just don't just don't go for it if it seems too good to be true. How about that? So, OK, so you and I come from a perspective where I think I, I feel comfortable being able to evaluate, evaluate what's too good to be true. And I think you're coming from that same place. But let's let's break it out. What is to, what really is too good to be true? Like it, uh, if I talk with somebody and they're going to make a I'm going to invest my money in in some mutual fund and someone tells them hey guess what you're going to make 300 percent the first year I, okay we all know that's too good to be true something's really fishy or it's really right. high risky you know your your bank if you're lucky is paying you you know 1.5 percent interest on your money so if they're willing to pay you that little then you know anything you know 100 times that is is something's getting squirrely but when it comes to you know other opportunities, how do we you know how does the layperson who's maybe not a, as savvy with a particular industry, or they're just getting into a job market or just looking at entrepreneurial opportunities, how do they know what is too good to be true? I mean, I, yeah, if someone says, "Hey, you're going to make ten million dollars the first year." Yeah, you know, turn and walk away. Yeah. But if someone says, "Hey, you're going to make you know twenty five or fifty thousand dollars the first year." Could that be, you know, how do you evaluate if that is really too good to be true? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you'd want to say, you know, doing what? And I, I think asking lots of questions, right? Like if you've ever been around a cop. So so when I was well, probably 2010, 2011, I was doing affiliate marketing and I got in with this group of guys um, that were all, we were all part of the same training platform. And I, I lived in New York City at the time. And across the river in Jersey, there was this group of guys, really good marketers. And I, I kind of buddied up with them. And uh, well, it was a long way of saying one of them was a cop, right? One of them was a, a detective in Paramus, New Jersey. And uh, this guy, every time I got in a conversation with this guy, I felt like I was being interrogated, right? Because <laughs> he, he had just developed this habit of asking an insane number of questions. And it was just, and you could feel it. Like he did, he wasn't even like doing it on purpose, right? He just, he was just always on. It was like, it's how I picture like hanging out with Jim Carrey or something. Like he's always <laughs> going to be cracking jokes, right? Like this guy was just always on, always reading you, always asking questions to see how you'd respond. And I think that you have to be willing to ask a lot of questions. Okay, so I'm going to make $25,000, $50,000 a year. First of all, is it 25 or is it 50? Because that's a yeah. 100% difference, 
right? What is the, is it, is it variable? Is it fixed plus variable? Is it, are you giving me like on target earnings? Like what is this range of numbers that you're giving me and what am I mechanically doing? And if, if they give you an answer, that's like, well, you're going to be doing, you know, medical, medical billing and coding, let's say, then like real quick, like maybe you're doing an interview over zoom. I mean, I, I can demonstrate this uh, average pay for medical billing and coding, right? Ah, $46,700 median annual salary. Okay. That sounds reasonable, you know, like, yeah. but, but be, and, and here's the thing, the, the person on the other side, they're going to have one of two reactions. They're either going to get really annoyed and squirrely, or they're going to respect your thoroughness and your thoughtfulness. And they're going to go, oh, if this person is this thorough in just applying for the gig, I'll bet they'll take great care of my customers, right? Yeah. So you win, so you win either way. You either run them off, or you or you make a you you get yourself noticed. I, I think one of the other things I also hear is like if if the person that you're looking to get a job from can't explain what you're going to actually be doing, like what does what what does what an eight hour day at this job look like, or what you know on a four hour job, four hours a day, what would I actually be doing for the first two hours of the day? What would I be doing for the next two hours? Oh, you're you're interfacing. What the heck does that right. mean? <laughs> right, right, right. You're doing a process analysis. Um, so, so, and I think another thing, and, and you know, that we're sort of, we're sort of talking, I think about two different categories. There's like, I would call them job scams. Yeah. And then there's business opportunity scams, right? Yeah. Um, and, and I'll be honest, I don't know as much about job scams, right? So I'm sort of going off of of, you know, just common sense. Again, just being like a common sense entrepreneurial thinker. I'm like, here's 10 things I might look out for. But the business opportunity scams, like I can speak to some real specific stuff there. Um, first of all, if they're talking about commissions, but it's not a sales job, mm. Then try to understand like well, what am I earning commissions on? Because you're probably getting recruited into something where you're going to get into recruiting other people for the same thing, right? Um, if they're if they ever talk about selling you leads, that's another huge red flag. Like oh you're you know it, like if there's some business opportunity or something you're going to be doing, that's one of the quickest ways you can out somebody to see if it's legit or not. How am I going to get my customers for this whatever thing you're talking about? And are they gonna are they gonna sell you the leads? Are they gonna give you the leads? Like if you're a let's say it's a real estate office, right? Like oh, we're gonna give you we're gonna print out lists of people that are thirty days behind on their mortgage, and we're gonna give you a list of people to call and to try to get a home listing. Like okay, yeah. that makes sense, right? But are you gonna charge me for them? Because one of the things is in in business opportunity law, you're not actually allowed to sell people leads for an opportunity that they paid you to become a part of. Mm. So that right there, if they're offer, if they, if there's any talk about buying leads and that comes from like the actually derives from all the business opportunity red uh, regulations around the vending machine space where people would, they would sell you a, a, a route yeah. and then they would like, you know, have some service that sent people down your route. Anyways, um, if they, uh, if there's any like, conflation between education and the business. And I think this is one thing that people need to get really, really keen on. You should never have to spend money to make money from a business opportunity, unless it's either a registered franchise or it's a registered business opportunity. And that means there will be, if it's a franchise or something called a UFOC, a uniform franchise offering circular, it's a disclosure they have to be able to give you. And if it's a business opportunity, they should be able to tell you in what states they operate, in what states they're registered as business opportunities, and they should be able to show you those registrations, right? And so if if, so, if there's any investment required to get involved in a business, then you need to ask that question. Is this a franchise? Is it a business opportunity? Show me the registration, right? Or provide me the disclosures. Um, you should also, if it's anything where you make income through the resale of their products, they should be able to provide you something called an income disclosure. Mm -hmm where it says this percentage of people that sell these products make this much money. And by the way, it's always terrible. It's like 0.2% of people make over $300 a month or something. And, and what, what you're talking about is probably for, for most people would be network marketing or MLM is where you see that kind of thing, right? 
Yeah, it is. But in the United States, MLM and network marketing has enough of a stigma that there's a lot of people, you know, a lot of, and I, I actually don't have a problem with MLM as long as it's done above board, but there's a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing now yeah. where they're trying to call it something else, right? Like, yeah. oh no, no, this is, uh, this is information consulting. Yeah. Right. Or no, no, you're going to be, uh, you're going to have your own regional, independent regional distributorship or something like, okay, it's MLM. Let me see the income disclosure. Right. Um, and then I, I, but, but, but on the flip side, it is very reasonable if it's education, education costs money. Yeah. But you have to force them to be really clear. Is this a business opportunity or is this education? Like, for example, at Entra, we sell education. We're like a college. I mean, we're not accredited, but it's like you learn how to go out and do a thing, right? Yeah. Um, well, God, there's a lot more. I don't know how deep you want me to go. <laughs> I, I actually have a YouTube video called uh, that I shot years ago that's called uh, 10 Ways... To know if a make money online guru is full of shit. <laughs> I hope I'm allowed to say that on your podcast. But that, so anyway, I, if, if somebody wants to hear like a 40 minute diatribe about 10 ways to know that it's out there. Just to Google that. I mean, I mean, should the general thing be, you know, if someone. I, 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 I'm wrestling with my wording here because so many people like. Yeah, if someone's going to say, hey, you're going to make a million dollars and you don't have a really good skill set, it's, it's probably a scam. Yeah. Yeah. And and what are they saying? I mean, are they being really, really upfront about like basically it's it's actually OK, I think, for there to be a level of compensation that is attractive. Yeah. Perhaps more attractive than other options you have in your life, as long as it's coupled with here are the skills you are going to have to develop in order to qualify for this, this skill set. For example, I, I'm, I met a guy recently and uh, I'm actually hopefully hopeful to bring this training into our platform. And this guy basically can take any, anybody with any, uh, any amount of IT background and in, I can't remember if it was six weeks or 90 days, but either way, it's some relatively you know, compact interval of time he can train them and certify them to be an what's called an agile scrum master. Mm -hmm. I know you come from tech. You know what an agile scrum master is, right? So agile agile scrum master gigs start at one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, and they're they're pretty like you work from home. They're very lifestyle friendly, right? So you can have some guy who's been, you know, doing hardware. You know, let's say he's a Microsoft certified networking specialist who's been making seventy thousand dollars a year, go doing you know setting up networks at small offices, and he can go through a ninety day program. And literally double his value in yeah. the market. That's totally legit. Yeah. Because they're like, you know, this is the this is the gig. These are the skills. This is you can go vet it on Glassdoor or, you know, Indeed or whatever. And and that makes sense. But like somebody's got to be able to answer that question of what skills, what clearly high value skills am I going to have to develop to qualify for this increased earning opportunity? Yeah. So if the person has no IT experience. Uh, I'm afraid of computers. I, I don't I don't even know how to use Excel. I don't you know, I, right. I just I, I just use my tablet to go online and check my email. Then that opportunity is unrealistic for them. Yeah, that guy's not gonna be a scrum master. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so you, you, you talked about uh, your your like for kind of the, the psychology, the education aspect of it, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the way the mind works. What is it that that you think makes people fall for kind of these get rich quick schemes, these things that uh, these opportunities, whether they're job opportunities or business opportunities that are just outside their, their scope, their ability, their means to actually be able to achieve. Yeah. I think that it is, it, it actually goes to sort of a deeper systemic thing. I think that it's symptomatic of kind of an underlying call it despair um, in our world. Pause right there. My computer's mm -hmm. about to die. My plug must have come out. Hang on a quick yep. sec. I'll pick up that thought. All right. Pick up right. A fun world. You know, 
A lot of it comes down to hope. And, and I don't like that word because hope is like not a strategy at yeah, all. Yeah. Hope is not a, a, a tactically useful. But I think that we live in a world now where people feel like they've there's been a fundamental bad trade. And frankly, I don't really disagree with them. I mean, that's why I'm on a mission to reform the education system, because the fundamental bad trade was participate in the system, be a good little foot soldier, go to college, take on debt, which now is all owned by the government, you know, government, the, the affordable Healthcare Act, which was supposed to be about healthcare, also nationalized all student debt. So the government owns your, your college debt, right? But do that and then go get a job and we'll manage the economy so that what your job pays you will allow you to live this nice life, this whole American, picturesque American dream, right? And do it all on the basis of this retirement promise that, you know, we will be fundamentally solvent over time. And if not, we'll give you some assistance with Social Security or Medicare or whatever, right? And like people now are just like, None of this has been well managed. Yeah. None of this is going to pan out. And there's this like despondency of like, what am I supposed to do? You know, and you think about it, like, if you think of like, like, I remember hearing an interview with Barry Sanders once, right? Great NFL running back, played college at Oklahoma State. I don't remember where he was from in high school. But he was talking about how his dad sat him down one day. And I'm going to connect this to the question, I promise <laughs> His dad sat him down one day when he was like 12 years old and said, Barry, you got a gift and you're going somewhere, but everything that's going to happen to you between now and when you get there is going to be designed to try to stop you from getting there. Parties, girls, drugs, gangs, all of it, just distractions. It's all designed to stop you from getting where you're going. But Barry, I'm here to tell you, son, you got a gift. And if you want to take this all the way, you can be one of the best ever, right? So what did that what did that conversation give Barry Sanders? It gave him hope. It gave him a this sense of like, if I do the work, if I stay on the straight and narrow, if I don't look for, if I don't fall prey to the enticements and the trappings of the world, I have this great promised land waiting for me that I have a shot at achieving, right? And so he talks about how in high school, he literally never went out. He didn't, he was a, world-class athlete on a high school football team. Trust me, they wanted him at every party. Yeah. He never went because he had hope. He had a direction, right? The average person in the modern world is the complete opposite of Barry Sanders in high school. They are, it doesn't matter what I do. There's no good outcome for me. There's no good path for me to be on. And I think that in that space, people get, it's not overt desperation. Mm -hmm. It's more of like existential recklessness because frankly, whatever they have, whether they'll say it or articulate it this way or not, whatever we have to lose, we don't really believe in anyway. Yeah. You know, like, 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 oh, this, this looks like a scam, but compared to what the whole damn system is a scam now. I mean, that's how I see it. Yeah, and I think it doesn't help that there are so many news stories about, uh, you know, prior to six months ago, hey, this guy just, you know, hey, I, I invested in crypto and six weeks later I made a, you know, half a billion dollars. And there's just these news stories about these atypical cases yeah. you know, that, that yeah. these individuals who had no skill did something and suddenly they're, and, and so everybody's like, well, I have no skills, that could be me, let me... Yeah. And Brilliant. I think there's, I think there's also, um, you know, one of the great, I think, tragedies of modern society. And, and a lot of this has happened literally at like a neurocognitive level with, with media and stimuli and social media. And I'm not, you know, I'm not anti-social media. I think, you know, use it responsibly, which is probably a lot less than most people do, but we have really, really developed a, a, a toxic relationship with delayed gratification. Yeah. Like, the, the 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 think of your grandparents like the whole ethos 50 years ago was built on delayed gratification now yeah. you can build a society on delayed gratification when if you delay there will actually be gratification <laughs> now p delay for what i'll be 70 years old and my and and i'm either going to be living with my kids or i'm going to have to be a greeter at walmart because the job i'm in sure as heck isn't going to have me retired so there's there's nothing to delay for at this point 
But as soon as you and, and we're all our brains are getting all scrambled where we want it in six seconds or we want it in 30 seconds or we, you know, whatever. And so, and, and we literally don't even trust our own innate ability to do hard things over protracted periods of time. Times at the gym or failed on the diet plan or failed in the relationship. Not, not because it wasn't doable or it wasn't achievable, but because we just wanted it sooner or we didn't yeah. want it to be so hard. Right. And so in a society that has, you know, a, a, a dysfunctional or, or has lost its sense of delayed gratification and in which a, a general existential hopelessness has settled in that there's really nothing that much better to hold out for. I mean, dude, if I if I wanted to be a scammer, this is a society I'd want to do it in. And lots of people are doing it in this society, unfortunately. Oh. Yeah. So anyway, you got me on my soapbox, but there's my summon <laughs> for the day. No, I I I think that's a good spot. Is like we have to realize. I mean, you you have to put in hard work on an opportunity. Whether it's whether you're you're doing your own gig, whether you're being the entrepreneur, whether it's a business opportunity, you're going to have to put in work to get rewarded. Someone's just not going to yeah. hand you a pile of money. Yeah, and you and you kind of got to. I think you have to develop a moral aversion to the idea of things of things being easy. Literally, we've been told since we were kids, nothing worthwhile is easy. And if A does not equal B, then logically B does not equal A. And that yeah. means nothing worthwhile is easy. Nothing easy is possibly worthwhile. So, you know, my favorite quote, if somebody takes the time to scroll all the way back on my Instagram to the very first post I ever made, it was a, it was a, a little quote card of my favorite quote. It's by Jim Rohn. He said, don't wish it were easier. Wish you were better. Ooh, that's a good one. And I think that if you will embrace that, you will probably become scam proof. It definitely will help. So if people want to learn more about the Entree Institute, where can they go? Um, honestly, entreeinstitute.com if you just want to <laughs> learn about the platform. Um, I, I, you know, but at Entre, at Entre, there's stuff to buy. If you want to go someplace where there's nothing to buy, yeah. um, go to my YouTube, okay. Jeff Lerner Official on YouTube. I have literally, I think almost a thousand. I know I'm over 900 free training videos that talk about all manner of things related to personal and professional development in the modern world. Um, I, my goal when I started my YouTube channel was literally to create a free resource that teaches people more real world monetizable value than Harvard MBA. And I've been told that I pulled it off, I guess, to each their own to judge. Um, I do have a book if somebody's willing to spend 20, I think it's $28 for hardback on Amazon. Uh, it's called Unlock Your Potential. It was the number two nonfiction bestseller uh, when it came out last year. And it's it's got, four, I think, five points. I don't think it's it's gotten any bad review on Amazon. I don't know. Somebody will probably <laughs> get, give me one now just because I said that. But, uh, yeah, I, I put a lot of stuff out there to try to get people to see what's possible for themselves before they pony up the money to actually enroll and learn how to do it. So no, that's that's, that's a great that's a great perspective and a great place for people to start. We'll make sure to uh, link to all those resources, the YouTube channel, the book, and Entre Entre Institute, if I can say that. <laughs> well, thank you, man. I appreciate it. This has been great. Please keep doing what you're doing, man. We gotta we gotta we gotta wake people up to to become scam proof. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me.